Our constitution does not copy the laws of neighboring states. We are rather a pattern to others than imitators ourselves. Its administration favors the many instead of the few. This is why it is called a democracy. If we look to the laws, they afford equal justice to all in their private differences. If to social standing, um, advancement in public life falls to reputation for capacity, class considerations not being allowed to interfere with merit, nor again does poverty bar the way. If a man is able to serve the state, he is not hindered by the obscurity of his condition. Yeah, I think it's uh, uh, much easier to read than the first translation that we looked at uh, before, you know? Mm -hmm. So I think it's very well adapted. Uh, Emily Greenwood wrote something about translation, translations of Thucydides, and she said you should go over them and compare them with the Greek, and you should go over them and compare them with previous translations, and nobody ever does that, <laughs> uh, which is unfortunate, but um, so, but we are doing it now, and um, so you can, I think by comparison with the Greek, uh, it comes off as really a big improvement in terms of clarity, but if you were to read it, I don't know if you can imagine reading it without reading the Greek. There's a lot of abstraction there. And there's a lot of parliamentary language. You may also notice, by the way, almost every clause is the same length as the preceding clause. I don't know. There's something like uh, the obscurity of his condition. Right. Maybe it's, yeah, maybe we could, uh, that's the obscurity a good, is good. That, that's yeah. a good point. Yeah, the obscurity of his condition. You're right. That doesn't, that's not a common English phrase today, is it? Mm. I should tell you, by the way, he, he has one famous, have I told you this? He has one famous uh, thing in, in chapter 65 of book two, where he says the Peloponnesian War, Athens defeat is caused in the Peloponnesian War by the Athenians intestine disorder. And, and he means their internal, <laughs> right. their internal civil war, and right. and even that never gets changed even today. And yeah. so when I teach Thucydides to a non-specialist who people can't look up the Greek, they go away thinking it was because of the plague. Uh, <laughs> that, yeah, that they, that there's yeah. something they had stomach aches because of the plague. Um, so, but, but it makes sense in its own time, and, but um, mm -hmm. not today. Uh, this is, and this is kind of like that obscurity of his condition. That's a good candidate. It's also, by the way, very helpful in that it's something you can probably change without wrecking the whole structure. You can, mm -hmm. you, you don't have to rewrite the whole thing. You can probably change just that. Although I can't offhand think what that would be. Something, if you go back to the Greek or maybe find another translation, he, he's not hindered by, by his low status, maybe something like that. You don't want to yeah. make it too modern, but low status would would be the contemporary meaning. Probably low status wouldn't have meant anything to Crawley. So that's one thing we could do. It says they are private differences. What are those private? Why are they private? And uh, those private differences that making people different. Right, and I think it's taidia diaphora. Hmm. And technically, the, that's the correct translation of both. But the the phrase in English implies private. Private doesn't mean so much as as I think what he means is citizen to citizen, rather than citizen against the state. So if you're suing your if you're suing somebody for if you're um, charging somebody with assault and battery, that's a private difference. But we wouldn't call it that. So we'd, we'd like to have some other word other than private, I think, for mm -hmm. things that are what the kind of law that's involved. And differences is, a diaphora is much more serious than differences. Um, a diaphora is, actually the war is called a diaphora by Thucydides. Mm -hmm. And it, it could mean a quarrel, a feud. It can even mean a feud. In other words, the laws, the laws do settle disputes. I think mm -hmm. the laws he's talking about, you, you, you end up in a court. Um, he's going to talk later about non-court things. He's going to say in a, in a later passage, which some people have found very odd, he says, um, 
we live and let live. We don't criticize our neighbors. We don't have fights about, you know, their music being too loud and we don't like them parking on our driveway and stuff like that. We just don't do that. We, li we live and let live. Um, and that seems kind of an odd thing to say. Um, but here it's in court cases where you are disputing with your neighbor. In other words, there's a lot of hostility there and somebody's angry at somebody else. You are equal. Oh, that's another. Okay. No man is above the law. That that's significant, right? So we would mm -hmm. we would say this is the difference between the law and um, the uh, government, right? The administrative. Um, anybody can be president, but the only person who is president is somebody who's elected by everybody, and presumably that person is highly qualified. That's what uh, Pericles would say. But when you go to court whether uh no matter what you're standing or what your reputation well it's like justice is blind right the idea that justice has a blindfold on it can't really see who you are it doesn't know if you're wealthy or poor whether you're very whether you're a celebrity or a nobody so i think we'd want to express something like that if we look to the laws they afford equal justice in their personal disputes personal as opposed to public and there are many examples of court cases. You know, the speeches of the attic orators are all about very bitter, hard fought court cases where people absolutely hated each other. And um, and we would say, by the way, from reading the attic orators, we would say that the law is not, in fact, very important at all. You can interpret the law in any way you want. But Pericles is not concerned with what we think today about the Athenian democracy. He's he's idealizing it. Definitely. The concept of equality. But I think you can see that the wording here is incredibly important. You want you have to get across this. This is the leader of Athens telling you what's good about Athenian democracy. You want it to make sense, but you also want it to make sense in terms of what we know today, concepts that we're familiar with. Is there anything you want to say about Crowley in general? Just this morning, I ran across something from Emily Greenwood, which is really interesting. She has a quotation. I wouldn't recommend her article. Her article is good as a whole, but it doesn't get into the nuts and bolts of, of the translations at all. But she starts out with a quote by a, a, a man named Wilkins, who translated the speeches of Thucydides. And he said that all before him were bad. And he, he characterizes them. At present, so far as English versions are concerned, for all practical purposes, the field is occupied solely by the portly pedantry of Bloomfield, the grotesque likeness of Hobbes, the hideous fidelity of Dale, and the vagrant slipshod paraphrase of Crawley. And, and you, you expect that Mr. Wilkins came up with a really good translation, but his translation is so bad that I never even heard of it before. Um, he says mainly his his goal is, according to Emily uh, Greenwood, his goal is mainly to help people who have to take exams on Thucydides um, to work as a trot for him. So, so one person at least thought that Crawley was a slipshod, uh, the vagrant slipshod paraphrase. And I'm not sure, he obviously wanted phrases rather than uh, critical insights, but I imagine by paraphrase, he's implying that he didn't stick to the Greek. And it could be that Crawley is considered the most free translation of, of them all. And that may be why others have tried. If you look at the, say, the, uh, the, the uh, Oxford translation that's around today, certainly the Lattimore translation that's around today, that's relatively new, they are more, um, they are more literal translations. Um, and they still manage to make sense. Although even in this passage, even they um, have to change the structure quite a bit. But, um, but I find that uh, Crawley does an amazing job of finding new structures um, and yet retaining the contrasts and of also finding new words in English and yet retaining the concepts. So the contrasts are there and the concepts are there still. But you can't really find anything of the original syntax um, in them at all. And in this passage, you certainly wouldn't want to, right? You, that would not be a plus. Mm -hmm. Right. I can see why it would be called a paraphrase, because the structures are changed. But they're clear in English, and they, they couldn't be clear in English if they were faithful, I think, to the, um, 
to the Greek. Um, I will say this passage isn't a good one to show the other thing I've thought about probably, but um, he can be quite eloquent at times, um, really. And, and the funeral oration, that's good because he's, he's talking to people who have lost their, their sons and their brothers or their friends in battle. And, and, um, and he's talking about the general group of men who have died. And so uh, when it comes to that part, he really has to have words that make an impression. And, um, and he finds them. He finds them almost, I would think, better than Thucydides does. It may be a little misleading in that way. Um, sometimes he doesn't, but, um, but usually he does. And I think that's probably, and, and there's one other thing about Crawley. We know that Thucydides lived a long time before us. We treat him as a modern. That's one thing that uh, Neville Morley has pointed out. Thucydides is the only ancient author we read as if he were around today. We assume that he would not have been surprised in any way by anything we do today. War in Ukraine, Thucydides would have said, yep, page 65, look, look it up. Um, and uh, we assume that Thucydides was just extremely insightful into human behavior. Um, but he, we know we also expect him not to sound like us. We really don't want him to, to read like the newspaper um, or even like current speeches. And Crawley, uh, without, you know, he can take no credit for it. He is old. <laughs> Probably in his own day, he did sound like the newspaper or the parliamentary debates. But today he has that sense of dignity and of distance um, that, we, that we look for in a translation. Um, and that's what's so hard to reproduce. Believe me, I, I should mention, by the way, I once was contracted to do a Thucydides translation. I was contacted to do it and said, well, I can do anything. Obviously, I know Thucydides well, I'll do it. And, and it was for the penguin, right? And, um, and I, didn't, I didn't take it as seriously as I should have. What I should have done is drop everything and think of nothing else. And um, what I did basically was do what I thought was a readable accurate translation. And um, I changed editors in the meantime. Um, and when I sent him my first, the first book and most of the second book and all the speeches, um, I got a return letter canceling my contract <laughs> because the, the clause uh -huh. they were gonna use to cancel my contract was um, no literary merit. And um, uh, so, um, and I could see, I, and then thinking about, well, I, it was actually a favor to me because I could realize my study of, for example, I was approaching it in really a bad way. I was approaching it like a scholar. That's when my interest in Thucydides and vocabulary began. I had decided I wanted to translate the words accurately, like on cause, you remember I mentioned? How would it be for the Penguin translation to use, to, to, to get rid of the word meaning cause for ITEA? Um, that wouldn't have gone over well. Um, so um, I, I was grateful for that, but I could also see that um, you needed a voice. You needed a voice. And if have any of you look at Tom Holland's translation of Herodotus, the the new one, which is what the Penguin had done just before mine. I mean, you open it up, and um, uh, you know it's easy to look down at it, but it's very readable. Um, you open it up, and the first page you say, "Wow, this is Game of Thrones." right herodotus is game of thrones completely and um and uh but it works everybody loves it everybody everybody thinks that translation is amazing because it gets into that world it gets into a world of the past um not a real world of the past but it convinces you that it's a world of the past it's a voice that you can understand and um mm -hmm. and i don't think that's really hard to come up with in thucydides um Hobbes, I, I experimented with Hobbes because Hobbes, of course, is very old and he's very dignified. He's very famous like Thucydides. Um, he's a character. He's a persona. Maybe we should use Hobbes, but uh, Emily, Emily uh, Greenwood is right. He's, he's beyond the pale. He's too old. He's not readable. He's just not, he's just, it's just not our English anymore, um, Hobbes' translation. Um, so I think Crawley is about the best you can come up with. 